Our next speaker, we're very, very pleased to have um, Peter Ford with us. Um, Peter Ford is a former UK ambassador to Syria. He's held ambassadorial positions both in Syria and Bahrain um, during a long and esteemed uh, diplomatic uh, career in the diplomatic service. When he retired in 2006, he became a representative of the Commissioner General of, the, of UNRWA in the Arab world. Peter's been a long-time critic of the media's role in disseminating a narrative often slanted towards a, re a regime change agenda. Given his um, ambassadorial um, uh, time in Syria, obviously he's going, he particularly uh, refers to the situation there. He's undertaken many interviews of late, which we've been very grateful for. He's done a sterling job. Um, and particularly, he had an interview with uh, BBC where he let them know the true nature of the White Helmets, which was refreshing. Um, he also had an interview on uh, Fox News, which was very good, on the Tucker Carlson show, which was, which was a very good interview. And um, I must say, Tucker Carlson let Peter speak, which was excellent. Um, he's recently resigned from his position as advisor to the Royal Charity Organization of Bahrain in protests at Bahrain's newfound support of Israel. So um, we are very, very pleased to welcome uh, Peter Ford. Thank you, uh, Sheila, and thank you, uh, everyone, for taking the trouble to come out this afternoon when you could have been watching the other concert in uh, the park in Swansea. So uh, I'm going to try and uh, rock it a little uh, <laughs> today. Um, the media are on trial, um, but what exactly are, are they on, on trial for? What's on the, the charge sheet? Well, the uh, Leibson inquiry, you remember, not very long ago, uh, had its own charge sheet. The media were uh, being investigated uh, for being naughty, basically, uh, doing uh, naughty things like going through tabloidy things, going through people's dustbins, that sort of thing. <coughs> this is trivial compared with what should be on the charge sheet, which is warmongering, aiding and abetting warmongering. You've al already this afternoon heard uh, several examples of that. I'm going to give you a few more uh, with particular reference to the, the recent flare-up over Duma, the chemical, alleged chemical weapons incident in that uh, benighted corner of uh, Syria. And I'm going to try to give you some of my experience as a, a, a practitioner of media. I've been fortunate enough by virtue of my previous position as a, an ambassador and UN official, being privileged on account of that, being a sort of uh, acknowledged expert, to get a foot in the door. And I'll share with you some of my impressions and some of the lessons that I've learned. Um, so my, my focus is going to be on the, the methodology that the media use, uh, the weapons of mass deception that they, they use to pull the wool over our eyes, consciously or unconsciously in, in many cases. It's worth remembering that this phrase, uh, weapons of mass deception, was popularized in the aftermath of the Iraq conflict. And it's this Iraq conflict that people need constantly to be reminded of. And when I get chance in media interviews, I do remind them, because it's all there. What we've been seeing over Syria, we saw previously over Iraq. Um, yeah, and I'll, co I'll come back to, to that um, as we, we go through. But you'll, you'll remember that the Iraq war was uh, theoretically about uh, WMD. It's always weapons of mass destruction, atomic, chemical, biological, whatever. For some reason, this is the, the huge bugbear, even though, as we've seen with the Skripal case, that very often these terrible, terrible 
weapons, they just give you a bad tummy. <laughs> uh, uh, anyway, WMD, it, it, it's a, it gets a, a, a reaction, gets your attention, doesn't it? Um, and in Iraq, um, of course, there were these allegations that Dr. Tony Blair said, uh, we saw the quote that it was beyond doubt, um, except he didn't. Um, we had the intelligence uh, chiefs of this country and America and all the NATO countries assuring us that Iraq had weapons of mass destruction, and it turned out that they didn't. Uh, you had inspectors, wep professional weapons inspectors like Hans Flix and Scott Ritter, very reputable people, uh, saying to the media that uh, it just wasn't the case, that there was no evidence. Uh, but these uh, inspectors were ridiculed. But it should have been the emperors of intelligence who were ridiculed. And they still, to this day, have not been held to account. Uh, so, uh, Duma, um, the, the full panoply of these weapons of mass deception was in evidence uh, when the crisis broke of the alleged incident. And note this word, alleged. Uh, it's still to be proven, and personally I doubt it can be proven, uh, that um, there were any chemical weapons used, whatever, in Duma. Um, we, we're waiting to see the report come out uh, by the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Warfare, OPCW. They went to Duma. Um, and we're, we're waiting uh, with bated breath to see their report, but I very much doubt that they will uh, produce evidence to corroborate the claims made by the Western governments. Uh, but to, to date, uh, it, it remains unproven. And indeed, on any ob objective uh, criteria, un unlikely. Um, and I was lucky enough to get the opportunity in some interviews to, to make this point that the, the reporting that was uh, driving the hysteria uh, wasn't based on fact, uh, that uh, everything could had a different expl a possible different explanation. Those videos that we kept seeing over and over again uh, were never verified, um, but there was an alternative explanation which um, was that there had been um, an ordinary bomb dropped on a nearby building. Uh, kids went into a nearby uh, clinic, and uh, they were just being treated for smoke uh, inhalation when the white helmets burst on the scene, grabbed the kids, hosed them down, posed nicely for the cameras, of course, who were always there, and hey, presto, that's all it needed to trigger almost the next big war in the Middle East. That was the alternative and surely plausible explanation of what happened rather than the, what I'd call a conspiracy theory that Assad, uh, in a moment of surely total madness, did the one thing that was guaranteed to bring down the West on his head. Uh, I, I would call that the real conspiracy theory, not the obvious explanation that I, I've just uh, described. So I, I had one or two chances uh, to put this view on, on the, in the media interviews. Um, and w one of the interviews was with uh, Naga Munchetti uh, on BBC Breakfast. Uh, and she spoke as though the alleged incident was established fact. And I reminded her that, hey, this video that you keep showing over and over and over again uh, is unverified. Isn't it, Naga? Uh, she didn't want to reply. Isn't it, Naga, unverified? In the end, she said, well, uh, yeah, it, it's unverified. But then Assad has got previous on this, hasn't he? He, he has a track record of mounting these attacks, so very likely the, the video uh, is or can be verified. So stop for a moment and, and think what, what, what was going on in this uh, exchange. 
I, I was presenting uh, an alternative, uh, plausible version of events, and she was behaving like the government spokesman. She took it on herself to counter my version uh, and to speak like a government spokesman. <coughs> is this the, the role of the, the BBC? Increasingly, yes, it is. And this despite the fact that we had Iraq. In, you remember in the aftermath of, of Iraq, many people in the media acknowledged that they'd made mistakes and never again, um, we're not going to be bamboozled again. <sighs> totally, totally forgotten. We, we, we suffer from mass uh, amnesia as well as uh, hysteria. Um, then there was uh, jo John Bolton of Sky News. Um, in my um, interview with uh, him, I, I launched my own uh, weapon, uh, a soundbite. Because, um, uh, you know, little parenthesis uh, here, when I'm lucky enough to get invited, I always try to prepare and be ready with some catchy phrase, uh, a soundbite, because this is the way the media works and you have to play them at, your own, at their own game if you want to make an impact. So I, I said uh, to John Bolton that with Duma, there wasn't even a dodgy dossier. They're not even giving us a dodgy dossier. And this <laughs> Bolton was obviously a bit gobsmacked by that. Um, but all he could think of saying in response uh, was, well, I'm sure the government will come up with a dossier. Uh, <laughs> and thank you. And that was it. That was it. And we're still, we're still waiting for the Duma dodgy dossier. Have you noticed? We still haven't had anything in black and white. And no wonder because the government would be very hard-pressed to produce a convincing case. Uh, in fact, I, I think they, 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 they know. This is why they haven't attempted to produce it, because they're not going to make the same mistake that Blair made, who did actually produce the dodgy dossier. So, and that, but when you have a supine media like this, you know, John Bolton's words are only remembered by me. Nobody's going to hold him to account, although I hope this will be recorded somewhere. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and um, I get an opportunity to go back. Sky, are you listening? And have another discussion. Perhaps when the inspector's report comes out. Um, you have to be a bit cheeky, you know, with the, the media. Um, because they're in uh, the business, not of information sharing, no, infotainment. That's the business the, the news programs in particular are in, even the documentaries. It's infotainment. So you have to be part of that. You have to make it a bit entertaining by being challenging or weird or what, whatever. Um, different people um, do it in, in different uh, ways. But what you must never do, I've discovered, is allow them to put you on the back foot to go on, on, on the defensive, like often in interviews uh, it's been put to me, how can you defend uh, Assad, he's a monster, he's killing his people, barrel bombs, and I'll say something like, you talk to me about Assad, when did you last do a report on what the jihadis are doing in eastern Aleppo and Duma? When did you do a decent report on Yemen and what the Saudis are doing? You see the, the technique? Don't let them put you on the back foot uh, because you, you've lost it then. I, I could give uh, a long uh, academic uh, explanation of, of why what Assad is alleged to have done is exaggerated. I would point out, for example, that uh, everything that we, the West, did in uh, rescuing Mosul and Raqqa from ISIS uh, is very similar to what has been happening in the cities of Syria with what the Syrian army has been doing. Our media don't tell you that they're still in Raqqa pulling babies' bodies out from under the rubble there. And that's what we did. 
but <laughs> even though it's children, the, the magic children, we're not interested. Doesn't fit the narrative. Uh, but when I get chance, if I get chance, I will remind uh, viewers or listeners or readers of, of that important fact. Um, I need to speed up. Um, moving on uh, from, um, from Duma, more, more broadly, um, the, the security um, agencies. Um, one thing that strikes me is how in recent times these security agencies have moved more um, uh, front uh, theatre. And we had an example of this recently when the head of uh, MI5... By the, by the way, would the MI5 person who I'm sure is uh, here like to... <laughs> I, I then, and, never mind, never mind. I'm sure you're taking notes. Uh, so pass this mes message back to your boss. Um, Andrew uh, Parker, head of MI5, made a speech at an international conference a week or, or so ago, which was carried live on our national TV. I couldn't believe it when I tuned in by chance. Being carried live. Even Boris Johnson doesn't get that reverence. He, he should be so lucky. But the head of our national... In, the, uh, our, our top, top secret policeman gets this reverent audience. And what was he saying? Well, it was a long diatribe about uh, Russia mainly, a little bit about terrorism, how wonderful our agencies are in fighting terrorism. But it was mainly to excoriate uh, Russia. Um, and the, the media just uh, gave it total reverence. A lot of what he was saying was very open to objection, to put it uh, mildly. But the the correspondent uh, uh, commenting later on what Andrew Parker said, not, not one of them asked a, a, or even thought of putting a, a question like, why are we being lectured by this unelected uh, head of our uh, secret policeman? Why is he, what's the constitutional propriety? These people used to have the decency to stay in the shadows. <laughs> I, I, and now, despite Iraq, despite them being responsible for carrying us into that war, they have the goal to come out and lecture us and tell us what's what and get more respect even than politicians. This is troubling. This is troubling people, the direction that we're going in. And in America, it's possibly even worse. I don't like Donald Trump, but I can see that the deep state in America is either out to get him or to control him. At the moment, they're, they're controlling him. Um, I don't agree that uh, Donald Trump, by the way, is a, an unmitigated disaster. He's a mitigated disaster. <laughs> uh, um, he, he doesn't like foreign wars. That's, that's something. But he's not, not very strong. He's not standing up against the, the deep state. Um, Anyway, this Andrew Parker chap came out with this, this stuff about Russia and the media just listened to him like it was Moses coming down with the Ten Commandments from Mount Sinai, uh, the, the, the reverence uh, of it. Finally, I'll just go back to the Duma uh, episode. Once the balloon went up uh, and the bombs started uh, dropping, our media went into jingoism mode. I couldn't stand it. It, 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 was, it was the glorification of, of war was unbearable. All we heard about was the, the devastating accuracy of our boys in blue operating out of that relic of empire, our base in, in <coughs> Cyprus that proves how important and powerful we still are as a, a major uh, power. This, this, not one uh, defense correspondent pointed out that of the targets that were hit, 
all of them had actually been inspected by the OPCW inspectors just a few months earlier and found com- completely clear. I mean, pause and, and just let that sink in, that we drop bombs on this country where God knows there's been enough bombs being dropped on it, totally unprovoked, Syria, nobody even claims that Syria is a threat to us, but we bomb them on the basis of these sites which were cleared of chemical weapons by the OPCW inspectors that we respect, um, and, and the enormity of it, but nobody even put that issue, raise that issue in the mainstream media that, that I know. Um, and, and then there's the, there was the aftermath when uh, the question became, oh, can the inspectors get in? Not one of the defense correspondents on their inflated BBC salaries mentioned who actually asked for the inspection. Immediately, the, the first... Uh, claims emerged uh, that there was chemical weapons. Who was it who actually asked for the inspectors to go there? Was it Britain? No. Was it France? No. Was it America? No. Was it Russia? Yes. Was it Syria? Yes. But you'd wait a long time to hear that very important nugget of information from our wonderful BBC, these paragons, this gold standard of reporting. So I I will just uh, conclude uh, now with a personal um, sort of interpretation of of this event today. What I hope it will help to create is is a consciousness that we can't go on like this because the next crisis is going to be much worse. And I very much fear that there is going to be uh, a next crisis in, in Syria uh, because the, the, it's so easy for the jihadis to mount uh, an episode like uh, Duma. They, they've done it repeatedly. Uh, they are bound to be preparing right now the next one. And the Western powers have painted themselves into a corner. They've promised that if it happens again, they will see what we're made of. and we'll, So they are bound. They've more, more or less committed themselves going in much more heavily. Now, do they really, have they thought this through? Regardless even of the rights and wrongs, of of whether it's true that there are chemical weapons or not, are they ready? Do they think that Syria will just behave like a punch bag every time? That Iran will act like a punch bag? That Russia will be humiliated? No, the next time... The next time, it is going to be catastrophic. And even if it doesn't, even if not a shot is fired in the end, it can cause a tremendous world economic panic because as soon as uh, Iran starts to make threats, the Gulf, there'll be fears of the the Gulf being closed. Insurance premium will zoom up on tanker traffic. There'll be queues at the petrol pumps. And if it comes to that, <laughs> hopefully governments will start to see sense. But this is the direction we're heading, and it's all driven by the media. The politicians are in a kind of symbiosis with, with the, the media, but if the media just started to be more cautious, learn the less, remember the lessons of Iraq, we might be spared this. So I, I just hope that today's event will help to create that, that, that tiny little bit of doubt uh, about trusting the media and be spread very widely. Thank you very much.